left off was Matthew 6, 16 through 18. I'm going back to that. And this section, again, to get the most out of this, I'm going to read this, then I want to pray, and then unpack it. And it's going to be very practical. But take these words. This is Jesus Christ's sermon. All I'm doing is um, highlighting his words. But when you think about this, this was God in human form, and this is called the Sermon on the Mount. This is His message. And so when I begin to think about that, the more I meditate, I'm like, my God, this you are the preacher, the teacher here. This was your sermon to me. And so everything you shared had great value and importance. That's why I don't want to skip it, because if it didn't, he probably wouldn't have preached it. So he was addressing things and correcting things. And in this section of his sermon, he's correcting fasting. So here's the scripture. It says, Matthew 6, 16 through 18. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will Will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So I just want to start with an encouragement and then prayer. Know this. Leadership under the kingdom of God, through his kingdom principles, is the unsung hero. Jesus today is probably doing more than he ever did when he walked the face of the earth. We just can't see it. But the Father sees it because he's operating through the Spirit. And so just know this, there are going to become many times you're like, is it worth it, the mundane of life? Why am I doing all this stuff? I don't get honored. I don't get validated. I don't get... And this is where I go to back to the truth when I need to encourage myself. This is what's valuable, most valuable in God's eyes, the little stuff that He sees. And it says, what is done in secret, He will reward. And so just know that's my encouragement to you, never to give up. Because um, we are in a trying times. And it's the stuff that He doesn't see, or the stuff that He sees that most people don't, that He rewards. So I'd like to pray, and then we're going to dive into this practical message. So Father, we love you, and we thank you so much. Lord, that you are a good, good Father. We thank you that you love us so much as your children. And we thank you, Jesus, that uh, you made an eternal covenant with us as your bride. And you're coming back to save us naturally and spiritually in the full world. And so, Lord, would you quicken our minds and our hearts to understand this so that we can be grounded in the fullness of grace and truth and deeply rooted and established in your love for us and for others. Lord, would you take the little bit that I have to offer today, bless it and multiply, open our hearts and our minds to receive the fullness of you. Jesus may be glorified through and through. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So beginning to break this down, I want to do one real practical thing. Um, when I was away on vacation, I read a book. And in the book, I just opened it up. And uh, it was a, a minister, a well-known minister. And he said, when I look for maturity in a Christian, he broke it down into three things. And I liked you know, what he had to say about it. He said, I look for three things, which is power, fruit, and love. And it made me think, and I kind of read his words, but it made me think about all the other scriptures with this. And so the tendency in our culture, whether we know it or not, is we're all, naturally speaking, trying to attain some level of power. That's, that's when you get into preaching and teaching messages. Everybody loves the power messages, and everybody loves the, the love messages. Tell me how much I'm loved, which is good. I'm not trying to, because that is what drives us. It's our driving force. And we need that. That has to be the most uh, taught after thing because it's the love of God that is our source and our strength. However, we want the fullness to grow into maturity. And the fullness comes into the context of uh, fruit, which we're going to talk about in chapter 2 in Matthew. Um, it starts saying that you can, this is about spiritual discernment. Spiritual discernment is when you have to use your natural brain to begin to discern because there's a lot of people, in fact, the power, when you look at power in the scriptures, you're often talking about the gifts. 
You look at the love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13, it says you can uh, move mountains with your faith. You can give all you have to the f poor. You can uh, give your body as a slave. You can speak in tongues of men. You can prophesy all these things, but without love, it is nothing. So what that's saying, 1 John 4 says God is love. So here's the scary reality that we need to understand. You can have spiritual power, and it's from the dark side, too. You can be operating, and this is why it's a, it's a, um, a debated topic in the church. But I will not throw the baby out with the bathwater because we still need the power because we're dealing, we are in a battle. But we have to learn to do it according to God's loving boundaries and His structures so that it operates the most in the principles. But the power is what we all love. And we're going to be getting to the power stuff. That's the gifts. The power generally has to do with the body, whether it's the human body, like we're going to get into two chapters in Matthew. It's all, you're seeing God's power is healing. But it's also the power for the body of Christ, the earth. When Jesus returns and His redemption of the body of Christ, the whole church, it's the power. And this is why the symbol is often the hands. When Jesus shows his power, he's, his, you know, in Moses, that's why it says in John 3.15, before John 3.16, that Jesus must be lifted up just like the serpent on the stick was lifted up when his hand was up, when the power was up. And that's why it's a misunderstanding in religion. People think that God is going like this to condemn them. That's not the truth. It's when God's hands up, his mercy is up, his grace is up, and the power is up. When the condemnation comes is when the Lord cannot stand seeing the effects and the hurt of His children, and they keep rebelling and rebelling that He has no choice to bring His hand down and turn His face. Why? I finally get this now from the Father's heart's perspective. Now that I have... Um, people and children whom I love deeply. You, there's a free will element of it if you're a parent of this. You can only give so much to your children guidance and they have to choose to do something with it. And if you can't force it because it's not loving. And so then you're, you're forced, the long-suffering Christ is to have to watch them go through stuff that you know, you know they wouldn't have to if they just listened to you, right? But there's, there's things where it's like, oh, I can't can't even watch this. It just makes me sick to my stomach watching my children or people I love seeing this. And that's the Father's heart in the Old Testament even. It wasn't that he's was angry. It's not that he can't look at sin because he's so holy and righteous. It's he doesn't want to because he doesn't want to see what sin's doing. And it's grieves. That's why it grieves the Holy Spirit. It grieves his heart because there is a better way and that came through Jesus Christ. But the power is often here. And, and we will, in, in certain sections of the scripture, we will emphasize the power component that's coming up. The love component, this is all about the motivation of the heart. So behind the gifts, behind the body, behind the hands, this is what they're always testing Jesus about. What's your motive? And Jesus would go right back at him. What's your motive? And this is often, really, it's the Spirit. God is love. That's His identity. That's who He is. It's the very heart, it's the very being of who He is. And so this is the component. Now in the world, it's just everything's flipped upside down. In the world, we all want power. That's why Satan fell. He wanted to be like God. He wanted more power. And so everything in a worldly philosophy is about power. Whether we know it or not, in, in carnal philosophy, you're always trying to connect to someone or something which will give you more power. Whether it's money, money will give you more power. Whether it's another person who has a greater platform, it will give you more power. Whether it's a partner in business or in something, it will give me more power. The fallen nature is all about power. Now, it says that Jesus did not give a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, love, and sound mind. That's why we have to have sound mind or self-discipline here, so that we use power appropriately that's grounded and established through love, not just for our own self-centered means. And this goes, uh, while you're, hopefully I'll be able to bridge the gap into fasting, because a lot of people, today's topic is about fasting. Fasting, when I was young, I was zealous. And in religion, fasting is a key tradition to religion. And what I'll say is an impure religion. 
There's in everything there's a good and evil component of it. And it takes spiritual discernment to understand it. When I was younger and fervent, but not mature, when you're young and immature, you always think um, the more emotion, the more power, the more ugh. But when you look at Christ, that's not, that's not how he walked. He said very little, and he was gentle in nature, and power happened. He didn't even have to say a word, and power would leave him. So in fasting, a lot of people will take fasting, and you're going to see it through Scripture today too, but there's a couple different ways they're going to use it. They use it as a religious tool to try to get more power. And that is not the right way to use fasting. We have to be very careful of it because what happens is we actually put ourselves back under the Old Covenant. And that's what Jesus is doing here. Remember, we're in this section of Matthew where it's going from Old Testament, Old Covenant philosophy and teaching to New Testament, New Covenant way of teaching. And he's, he's bridging and he's transitioning this over. Under the Old Covenant, you had the, the, the priests and did these religious fasting things because of about power and prestige and it was a religious order because of our works look at what we did and when we're young in our faith and I used to do this too it's like I'm going to fast more because when I fast more I'm, it's about my self denial and it's I can do this and there's a good component of learning self control through fasting I'm not opposed to that but it's again it's all about our heart that is where we have to be very sensitive about I'm feeling several questions about fasting People are contacting me. What do you think of fasting? And I said, you've got to be very careful with it because you, you, it's either going to be done in the spirit of love in your heart or you're just making a religious duty that you're putting yourself back under the law and you're going to get into a performance-driven mentality with it which is going to work against you and not for you. Because the minute you start to think, so Jesus plus anything equals nothing. That's the answer. Jesus plus anything equals nothing. So Jesus is the one, it's through His works and everything He did that we get this stuff. We just receive it by faith. The minute we add anything to Jesus, we've now entered into our own performance-based, works-based system. That's what the Old Covenant was trying to teach us. So if I begin to fast to get more power, that's why a lot of people, here's what you'll hear. We need to get this person healed. Let's all pray and fast. The more prayer, the more fasting. And it becomes about us doing this thing. And that gets us away from the gospel of God's grace and His goodness. Now, in our hearts and minds, if our hearts and minds are cluttered and the Spirit leads us into fasting over something so that we can just get into a place of intimacy and love, that's different. But one has to be discerning about how to use this. Today's message in regards to fasting really talks about fruit. And I'm going to tie this all together, hopefully, through the scriptures. So it's fruit. Is, so you got the gifts, you have the motive, but the fruit is about character. So when you think about spirit, soul, body, you got the spirit, which is the motive. You got the soul realm, which is about character. So spirit, soul, body, God's preserving us till the day of coming of Jesus. So the character is the soul realm. Your mind, your will, your emotions, your conscience. That's your fruit. Same thing as fruit. This comes into agreement when our head and our heart, the very heart of God and the Word of God, come, become one. This is a sanctification process that leads to the fullness of what's called glorification. So when our head, this is why we have to now have a sound mind and discernment through here. So we're evaluating this. So today's message is in regards to fasting is how do we fast? We have to use our head when we fast because it can be a temptation or a trial that's not from God because it is a practice. Now the scriptures do say that we should practice our faith. We should work out our salvation. That is a good thing. We just have to make sure we're doing the practice in a right way, in a godly, loving, spiritual way and not in a natural, carnal way physical way. So this is a brief overview. I pray that makes sense to you. If not, we can clarify it more and more. But I want to try to tie it in more to the next verses. So when it comes down to fasting, 
Let's look at what Jesus said about it. He said, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. So a couple weeks ago, if you remember, I taught on the history of hypocrites. Jesus called the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which were Old Covenant religious priests, um, he called them hypocrites. But they knew what that meant. They knew that that was what you're calling me as a Roman stage player, an actor. You're saying that I'm, I'm, I'm really not who I am. I'm just a paid professional, is the way they knew it. They took it. And that's what a hypocrite, hypocrisis. Um, I would encourage you, go to Wikipedia. I think Wikipedia actually does a good um, history of it and can lead you to some different links. Um, I believe it's uh, spelled hypo, so H-Y-P-O, krises, K-R-I-S-E-S. It's the Greek word for hypocrite. Um, if you type in, I think, hypocrite or hypocrisy in Wikipedia, it'll start leading you to the history of this stuff. Um, and it just talks about the stage playing. So again, it says, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. So remember, again, the acting of that day, they were teaching Roman philosophy, but also pagan theology through it. It's the way, it's similar to today. Most people are learning through visual right now, through YouTube, all these different people are getting away from reading. It's getting back to just teach me in person or publicly. Back then, they didn't have the internet. So the way they did it is they would hold plays and invite thousands in. And so they would try to get their philosophy and their theology out by teaching. And a hypocrite, the stage player, would do this. They'd use these masks. If you understand history, they'd have three generally actors, but they would just hold up a different mask so they could be a different person. And so that's what he's saying. He's saying, don't look somber. So when they were teaching how to worship these pagan gods, they would have a pe like a pagan god fall, and they would say, you need to fast to get right with the gods and they put up this somber face as an example of it. So Jesus is trying to correct that in that day and age. He's like, no, when you fast don't look somber as the hypocrites for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Because again, in paganism, in worshiping other gods, it's all about me, me, me. It's selfish because those are the fallen gods. It's all about them and their self-centeredness and their power. And they want humans to act like them in their image and their likeness. That's why the majority of the world is falling to the demonic philosophy of that. It's become all this self-centered me society because it's deceived and ignorant that this all began with the fall of Satan and his power trip and then his minions or the demons demons or fallen angels. It started way back then. He goes on to correct it by saying, Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. How have they received their reward? <laughs> Applause. Good job. You're such a good religious person. Good play. But they also got paid. And he's calling out the religious leaders of that day. Pharisees and Sadducees were not only teachers, they were the, they were the economic elite. But especially the Pharisees. The Pharisees were very wealthy. They were hidden wealth. And same as today. The greatest deception, even the Antichrist, just this is why we got to discern it. There are many that believe that the Antichrist could be on the earth today. So it will be a wolf in sheep's and lamb's clothing. And it says, by his fruit you will recognize him. That's why we got to learn what this fruit means. Um, so there's discernment that goes with this. They generally start out as what could be a really religious leader uh, with a false sense of unity. And then when they got enough control through their deception, then they take over. And so Jesus begins to call this out and give discernment to this process. He's saying, truly, I tell you, they've received their reform in full. They're getting it now. What he's trying to say is the day will bring everything to light. That day is when you're going to see who the true priest is, who the true Lord is, who the true power is, where it all comes from. And the only reason God is, isn't having it now is because He wants none to perish. And He's just patiently waiting for people to get understanding of this. So He goes on to say, so, 17, but when you fast, now He's correcting it, when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. He doesn't say don't fast. Notice this? He doesn't say don't fast, but He says but when you face fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father. So notice how it says only to your Father. And he addresses it as a Father. So this is really about an intimacy thing between you and God and an unseen thing. Does that make sense? This is about everything Jesus taught goes back to this. Love. 
a loving father. Can you help me? I'm, it's all about the heart. Okay, thank you. And feel free, church. This is organic. You can help me with this. I trust everybody in here. Um, it's all about the heart. So Jesus would always bring it back to the heart. Thank you, Kate, my beloved bride, who helps me always. So, but when you so then it says so that it will not be obvious. So it brings it back to the Father who is unseen, and the Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And your reward when you fast between it's you and the Father should be greater intimacy. Because what you're doing is you're just you're you're just taking time to spend with the Father. But when you do it for a standpoint of trying to create more power or more zeal or more, that's not the right motive. Okay? And if you don't believe me, Isaiah, remember the book of Matthew is deeply intertwined with Isaiah. All throughout the scriptures of the weeks and weeks and weeks, he'd refer back to Isaiah, refer back to Isaiah, refer back to Isaiah. So we're going to refer back to the prophet Isaiah to help us understand what true fasting is in God's mind. But before we go there, I need to hit one more point. This was, again, so you understand, because uh, the Apostle Paul corrects young Timothy, a young preacher, and this is one thing I had to learn, and I'm going to keep that we get discernment of this. When you read your Bibles, you need to understand there is a difference of how God related under the Old Testament, Old Covenant, and now under the New Testament, New Covenant, and there's a transition that's taking place. We're not in the New Covenant yet. Here's the another example of this. In Matthew 9, so we're not even in 9 yet. We're still in 6 through 7. But in 9 it says, Then John's disciples, so this is John the disciple, John the Baptist's disciples, come up. Remember, John the Baptist was probably the last Old Covenant prophet outside of Jesus. Jesus really was. But you got John the Baptist. He had his whole group of disciples. So they come up and they came and asked him, How is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? So they noticed that, so John the Baptist had his disciples, they're fasting, and the Pharisees, which were the religious leaders of the time, they're fasting, but Jesus is once. Now, whenever Jesus gives an answer to something, he often uses word pictures because it's loaded with meaning. And so when he says something, you've got to take time to meditate and say, Okay, God, you answered that in a funny way. Help me to understand. Holy Spirit, guide me to understand this. And just know, if you try to discern it through love, you'll get it. Love is the key that unlocks all truth. So let's now look at this through the lens of love. Jesus answered. So this is Jesus' answer to why his disciples did not fast. He says, How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. So interesting word picture. He refers to his disciples as guests of the bridegroom. So why? Let's think of what is a guest of the bridegroom? Who do you invite to your wedding? People you love, right? Your friends and family. That's good news. We're disciples. God sees us as friends and families. Okay, so he's calling his disciples friends and family. They're guests of the bridegroom. He refers to himself as the bridegroom. To get to ultimate maturity in your spiritual walk, you have to go from being a son of God to the bride of Christ. That's why God created family. That's why you'll see the scriptures always start with understanding your Abba Daddy and your identity as a new child of God. And at the end of all the gospel letters, and the whole book of Revelation is devoted to this, is understanding yourself as the bride of Christ, the church, and then Jesus as the bridegroom king. There's a different level of understanding love and maturity between a child and a marriage relationship. So Jesus is fast forwarding this. He's saying, I'm the bridegroom. Groom. It's all about that day. See how everything always hinges on that day. It's called the wedding supper of the Lamb. This is the book of Revelation. It's the end of all the gospel letters. Is when I return. My wedding supper. My celebration. So the guests of the bridegroom. So it says, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn? Mourn. So see how he's connecting fasting to mourning? Remember how before it said put on somber faces? So this is where you've got to be very spiritual discerning with fasting. Are you fasting and you're getting into a, Woe is me, morning, oh God. That's religion, bad religion. That's not what Jesus teaches. He's like, why would you mourn when you're with me? People ask me, do you fast? 
if, I, if I'm intimate with the Spirit of Christ in me, if I have intimacy and I'm longing, am I going to fast? No, I'm not in mourning. I'm in joy. Fasting is a way, way to, as if for some reason we get into the woe is me mentalities because we've lost intimacy, so we just got to take a moment to reconnect to the very heart of God as our Father and as our Bridegroom, King, and Judge, so that we're not mourning. But it does say, how can the guests of the Bridegroom mourn while He is with them? And this is a natural thing, too. That's a spiritual application. But Jesus also said, he's, he's prophesying all along the way. He's saying, hey, there's going to come a time when I'm here physically, but when I'm not here, they're going to fast again. But notice how it doesn't say, I want them to fast. It's just saying they will fast. That's happening today. A lot of people are going back to fasting. Is it God's heart or not? I have to say, you have to connect your heart to God to do it right. The number one thing is intimacy with God in this thing. He just People will take this and say, well, he's not here right now, so we should fast. It doesn't say you should fast. It just says they will fast. He was saying what will happen. It, we can't assume that that's what he wants. Because Scripture always interprets Scripture. I can tell you what He wants about fasting. And here's what the Scripture says about it. It's in, found in Isaiah 58. I've been meditating on this chapter. It's gripped me for years. It's a very powerful chapter. It's leading up to Jesus' return. And here's what He says about fasting in Isaiah 58. He says, Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. Now catch this. It's in italics on here. Verse 2. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways. That's generally, this is about fasting. This is generally why people fast. And they'll do multiple days. They say, oh, one day is not good enough. I'm going to do multiple days because I'm going to seek him out. Okay? Day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways, as if they're a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. So a lot of people get into fasting thinking, this is the right thing to do, and I'm going to seek him out. And I'm not opposed to that if it's done right, but it can also be done wrong. Jesus is trying to correct this here through the prophet Isaiah. For day after day they seek me out, seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands. Do you see? Would we need to fast if we just did God's commands? A lot of people go into fasting, myself included, in my own times, is when I get off, I have to fast. But what if I just listened to every command? What if I was just perfectly obedient to the, the Scriptures and the Holy Spirit inside of me? Would I need to fast or would I just keep intimacy? I want you to take a personal self-reflection in the times that you fasted. Was it because your spirit got dull, because it got grieved, because you weren't following His commands? Ah, dagger, right? <laughs> right? Let's personalize this. That's generally what happens. Is either I got away from the Word because life got busy, I started doing my own thing, and I, I got away from the principles of God. Now I feel dirty, rotten, and i got to seek Him and get back into it. But He never left us. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. That's the way we be very careful we don't make this into a religion. It's always about a relationship. So he goes on to say, they ask me for just decisions, seem eager for God to come near. Isn't that what fasting about? God, give me. When most people fast, give me an honor. Give me, give me, give me. Just something. Give me the just right answer for this. He's clarifying this. And they ask, but here's what happens in people's hearts. This, will, this is where it starts to get twisted. Is when people fast and it didn't do what they thought it was going to do for them. And he's correcting it in verse 3. He says, why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? So this is when someone fasts for a day and they didn't get the answer. Why aren't you noticing? I better fast more. Seek him out more. This is what's happening in the heart. And here's his response. Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please. So a lot of people will fast from food or something, but they still go their own way. They're doing the day routine, day whatever. They're doing as they please, but they're adding fasting to it. But notice how it says, and exploit all your workers. I think that's an interesting add-on to this. That, that denotes someone that's in leadership. 
and they have servants underneath them. That can be a parent, that could be a business owner, that could be anybody. That's, that's somebody who's prospered. He's addressing somebody who's been blessed and prospered, and there's some level of leadership to this thing. But he goes on to say in 4, your fasting ends in quarreling and strife. Have you ever fasted and you're not feeling well, so now it's like you get cranky? So this is God addressing all these things. He's saying your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and striking each other with wicked fists. Now watch his response to all this. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. This is something I've been studying in the scriptures. I want right expectations. What should I expect? So if I'm doing this religiously, should I expect that God's going to hear my prayer based on this? Verse 5, he corrects it. He says, is this kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it not only for bowing one's head like a reed and lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? Notice, do you see his correction? He's like, I didn't call this a fast. Is that what you call fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Now, red letters, his voice. And now I added the red letters. This is Old Covenant. You don't get the red letters in the Old Covenant because the red letters are New Covenant, Jesus, but everything in the Old Covenant is about Jesus. So it says, we know God's talking here. Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? So you want to know what fasting God's chosen? Here's what it is. To loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them? I'm going to pause there. I had a, here's a random bunny trail I had when I was reading this. What do you suppose Lucifer was supposed to do to Adam and Eve in the garden? They're naked. What should he have done? Clothe them. Instead, he shamed them. They were ignorant. They didn't know the Word of God. He did. Now I understand even some of the deeper deception and trickery of this. So whenever you study the Scriptures and study heaven, they're always clothed. Jesus is always clothed in robes of righteousness and white, and so are all the angels. Adam and Eve weren't, but Lucifer should have clothed them based on this Scripture. Jesus went on to clothe them. So is it not to share your food with the hungry, to provide the poor wanderer with shelter, when you see the naked to clothe them, and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Children, right? Brothers and sisters. Angels and humans are both created beings from God. We're siblings. Satan turned away from Adam and Eve. Lucifer turned away. He didn't clothe them, and he turned away. He broke this commands of God because he wanted more power. Now, how does this tie in to where we're at in Matthew? Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is about the fruit and about character, about the practices of the faith, about you behold and become love, and out of that, this is the practice and what you'll start to do. And true fasting is not fasting for food based on what the Father says. True fasting and what the Sermon on the Mount is all about is learning to live a fasted lifestyle. Why? Here's the motive behind it all, the why behind the what. Why does God want us to live a fasted lifestyle now? Because it's all about the day. If you don't get understanding that there is a day in all of our eternal lives that is going to change everything, you're not going to change your behavior pattern today. That's why he's saying today, and you'll see it again in scriptures. Verse 8. Now, here's the encouragement. If you live a fasted lifestyle, let's look at that. To loose the chains of injustice. We are going to be a church that begins to now, even in the natural, try to loose the chains of injustice. We are already doing that. I commend you guys that are serving orphans and serving prisoners and serving others. That is part of loosening the chains, both naturally and spiritually. Ultimately, how do we loose the chains? Who has been given authority to loose and bind? Us, right? Who is bound up in heaven? Where do we want to see true justice? Again, the authority has been given to the church, the body of Christ. Hey, Jesus! Come back! King, Lord, 
Mighty God, come back and loose the chains of injustice. That's what, to help you foreshadow what's coming, there's going to be oppression. We're starting to feel it on the earth. More and more oppression and injustice. And finally, this is the third and final round, just like it happens in every history. History repeats itself. The church finally stops trying to be self-centered, trying to start to unify. And the whole moral of the gospel is this. It says, before the day of the Lord, it says the fullness of understanding and maturity will come. So people will get the full understanding of Jesus, His threefold salvation message, okay? We get this. We have understanding. Hey, whoa, we need salvation because we waited so long. And the church begins to unify on Jesus' return because of the oppression of the government that's on the earth, just like it's happened historically. The good news of this is learning to live out the kingdom of heaven here and now. We can be a light amidst darkness. We can have true justice even when injustice is going out because all throughout history as there was always darkness, there was pockets of light and safety, security, and he, and he promises this. He says, when you do these things out of the motive of love, eight, then your light... Andrew did a great message on light. Then your light will break forth like the dawn. And your healing will quickly appear. For those who want healing, people will fast for healing. Just start doing these things. Why? Here's how it works. Spirit, soul, body. Generally, people need a healing in the body. When you do the right thing through the right motive, and when you go serve out of love, it does something to your soul realm, your mind, your will, and emotions. And it's really what happens in your heart. It starts to give you an attitude of gratitude, not greed, not selfishness. You begin to be thankful for the grace that you've been given and not feeling like, woe is me, because you see the greed and the self-centeredness that you don't have out there. It switches the, the metabolism of your body and it switches your hormones. It switches your mentality. It switches all these things here so then the body can, that's why it says that even on the inside God will begin to heal because the spirit that lives within our heart, he'll begin to sanctify and purify and glorify. It's how he created us to be. And so he says, hey, if you're not doing well, just, just start doing the right things and watch what will happen. So when people need healing, oftentimes most healing I've experienced myself personally, but also with those that I disciple and or coach, generally stems the root is fear or bitterness. And when you can get yourself out of that mentality into faith and out of bitterness and greed, now watch what happened to the body. You can't be on the outside what you're not on the end. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. This is what I'm praying for. How many of you in the days of injustice want God to have your back? I've been praying, Lord, okay, in these dark days, how do I keep? Because it says half of the bride, half of the church, half of the virgins are going to fall asleep. How do I keep the light and the intimacy with you? How do I keep the protection through you? And how do I know that I'm safe? And the thing is this, this is why we will, there is a balance that I need to correct in my own life. And you're going to see I'm going to be making personal changes. Because Satan's always going to try to get you one way or the other. The battle is always in the soul realm. If he can't get you one way or the other, this is the, the, the balance of the faith is the rock, running and drawing. Is the going and doing with hands and feet and missions, but then the drawing of just sitting and being still and knowing He's God and worshiping. And there has to be balance in the human body of this. I've been doing more lately in my own life of hands and feet, and I've gotten into this place where I need to sit and be still and hear the voice of God more to balance that out. And it's a correction that God's bringing in my own heart. But in this ministry, I've been thinking a lot about and talking to our board and talking to others is how do we keep this proper balance? And this is a real neat thing that's happening on the earth today. We watched a, a YouTube video of these 
contemporary ICMS spiritual giants. I've learned from many of them that are coming together, that live on this earth today, and honoring one another. They were fighting because of their, their high truth, but now the truth and the grace are marrying together, and these leaders are starting to say, hey, let's unite in Christ, and we are all God's children, and let's not forget that. Let's respect God enough, and let's unite on Christ in love, and have enough respect for God and for each other that we're all on the spiritual journey together. But what's happening is a lot of some of these leaders have ministries that are just missional, mostly. Not a whole lot about being in the prayer room 24-7. Others had ministries that are about being in the prayer room 24-7, but there really was no hands and feet. But they are now uniting and having conversation, and their ministries are becoming mature, is the ones that are mostly missional are spending time in the prayer room, and the ones in the prayer room are getting out to their hands and feet. And that is something that I'm going to be, and we are going to be very intentional about, keeping that balance between the two, and operating together in honor of one another of how we function as a body of Christ. So in doing this, he goes on to say, then you will call on the Lord and the Lord will answer. Remember how he said, if you do the other religious fasting, do you expect me to hear? But now you do this type of fasting and it says, then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here I am. So if you want to know how to get God's attention, there you go. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, how much of this is happening right now? And we have to be very, very careful of this. Because even in the church, this can happen. We have to have grace and mercy with one another that we don't start to judge others for their own spiritual journey. And I loved seeing this through these leaders that met because they were talking about other leaders and this and the way they used to thought. And one of them said, hey, I don't know if I even feel really good about us talking about this stuff. Why? Because we're all brothers and sisters, right? For you parents, how much do you like it when your kids talk bad about each other? Right? Even when one, like I have my daughter, who is a lot older than my other daughter. Now the maturity level is different, aren't they? And here's the moral of the story that I finally understood the father's heart with it. You have to be very careful of self-righteousness. My older daughter was right because my younger daughter doesn't have enough education. She was doing some things wrong. She's like, Dad, what she's doing is wrong, but she was getting frustrated and trying to correct the behavior, and it led to a fight and pointing fingers and malicious talk, and it wouldn't stop. And I had to say to my older daughter, Grace, you're missing the point. I just want you to love her. She doesn't get it. Getting angry and frustrated and pointing fingers and calling her out when she doesn't know any better does not help. You need to operate in the greater truth of love and have patience for her. And that's what needs to happen in the church. We have to begin to see that we are brothers and sisters in Christ and unite that we have one Father. But even more so this, guys. There's a level that you can say things about our kids and we can kind of brush it off because they're ignorant and you're talking about our kids and you're ignorant. But if you say something about my bride, you talk bad about my bride, she has a different maturity level, we might have some words. People got to get to the point where we honor the church as his bride. And I'm not going to talk bad. Would you go up to another person and start bad-mouthing their bride? I don't want to bad-mouth the bride of Christ. That's his bride. And it's a culture of honor, of love, and intimacy. That's the doing away with the yoke of oppression, even in the church, that we don't oppress each other with pointing fingers and malicious talk, bad talk. And if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise forth in the darkness, your night will become like noonday. So no matter how dark it gets, this is on earth as it is in heaven. We can, the kingdom of God can be here now in part until the fullness descends and comes here. We can have a grasp of that, and that we will do through the grace and the power of God, but we're not going to be satisfied with that alone until the day Jesus returns. That is the end of the race and the new beginning. 
The Lord will guide you partly. Always. Always. He'll never leave us. He will satisfy your needs. So even no matter how dark it gets, God will satisfy our needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. So when you feel weak, get your heart right with God by spending time with Him, and then go serve. And watch what will happen, spirit, soul, and body. The promise is this, and my ending encouragement to you is this. You will be, good timing, you will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. That's abundance of fruit, right? You will have an abundance of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, because you behold who is true love and grace and mercy, and now you become Him. And by doing that and giving that, in your soul realm, you're, you're becoming like Him because it's better to give than to receive. And that is how we'll stay healthy, happy, whole, safe, a light amidst of darkness. And ultimately that is how we'll find rest because it goes on to say, your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You'll be called repairers of broken walls, restorers of streets with dwellings. This is prophetic, I believe. This is what's going to happen. The church is going to raise up Jerusalem after it's been destroyed. There's one wall remaining. I personally, my own opinion, this is not doctrine, but Jesus said, when I come, every, everything you see here will be thrown down. Um, there is one wailing wall yet still standing. I think that will be my personal opinion. I'm not saying this is biblical theology, but I just think when the Antichrist comes and descends in Jerusalem, that wall will be thrown down, which will set a catalyst because now they can't pray there. Um, but we're going to raise up those broken walls. We're going to rebuild. Jerusalem is going to be the hub of the earth again when Jesus comes back. It's going to be the center of His kingdom. It's going to be where for a thousand years He still reigns as a human. And all heaven and earth are going to be united. And this is what is prophesying. If you keep from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day. In the Old Covenant, yes, it was established as an Old Covenant day. One day. I'm not going to preach this message. I have in the past. But you just need to know, and it's okay. Again, we have grace and mercy and patience with people. In the New Covenant, Hebrews 4 is talking about the Sabbath day and it refers to this. God again set set. In the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, He set the Sabbath as the seventh day, a day of rest. If you need a specific day of rest, take it. That still can be a good thing because remember, it's all about your heart and intimacy. But Jesus, when you walk, watch how He walked, He didn't say every Sunday I'm going to do nothing or every Saturday or, or even if in that day the true Sabbath was Friday at dusk till Saturday at dusk. He didn't say, I'm doing nothing. That's not how he lived it. He, he clarified the Sabbath is this. God again said a certain day, calling it today. So in maturity, is, it was, we're all growing to learn to find rest and health and whole being and peace and joy and fruit and intimacy and hope through the coming day. And that is today, every day. And the more we grow into maturity, the more we can find rest there. Am I there yet? No. Because we'll stumble at times in our growth process, but we will not fall because the Holy Spirit will always guide us back into He's a promise. So calling it today, this is, He did when a long time later He spoke through David in the passage already quoted today, if you hear His voice, don't harden your hearts. See how it's all about prayer? It's all about your heart. In conclusion, so it says, if you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath, that's supposed to be every day. And from doing as you please on my holy day. When is this holy day? Every day. Because in Him we are now made holy, it says. If you, keep, if you call the Sabbath a delight, do you love being in Him? Do you love resting in His presence? Do you love the hope that He gives us, the eternal hope, that one day we're going to live with Him on the earth, new heaven and new earth, and He's going to restore and redeem everything and resurrect all old loved ones, and we get to live for eternity together with Him, just like the garden was supposed to be before the fall. 
And do you find rest in that? And do you find confidence in that? And that no matter how bad it gets in this age, that is where we're going for thousands and thousands of years. It goes on to say, and if you honor it, honor, honor, by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord. I love this. And I will cause you. See how it's always about Him? In Him we can do all things. I have strength in Him. It says we can do all things through Him who gives us strength. He says, I will cause you to ride in triumph on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Oh, I'm done early and our worship leader's not back. Look at this, it's a new Andy. <laughs> What else can I say? What else should I do? People say miracles don't People say miracles don't happen. We all thought. I can always add more. You want to just grab Alicia? Can someone? Um, so in recap, I'll just summarize to make it very practical. I'll use this. Do you see how everything in the scripture is about love? Everything is about timing and eternity. And, but you have to under, think eternally. If you don't think eternally, you're never fully going to understand the gospel. There is no such thing. If you're a true believer, <laughs> there is no such thing as a true believer of, of really life and death. I mean, you can think of it from the context of, I may fall asleep, Jesus called her, pass away, but that's not, I'm still alive. Your spirit going into heaven, but you're going to come back with him, and you're going to get your body back, but it's going to not have the limitations. This is what the Bible teaches. It's not going to have the limitations we currently do have. But the moral of our story as believers is, we live eternally. Fully God, fully human, but it's going to be restored and redeemed. The challenge with this Oh, are we still taping? Yeah. My friends online, we're being very organic because I'm stalling for a worship leader to come back. <laughs> but I do want to say this again because this is something we have to have spiritual discernment with. The power comes quickly. You don't even have to be godly to have power. That's why you have um, fortune tellers. Can you tap into that? Yeah, that's demonic. You can have wrong spirit beings guiding forces. Power can come quickly as a gift. But what Jesus taught, and this is why the disciples sat with him at his feet for three and a half years, because they had to learn how to operate in the right fruit under the right motive. This is, it's got to get flipped upside down. The majority of our practice has to be focused on this, because that's what takes the most time. This is what eternity is all about. Learning to behold that he is love and we become like him. And it takes us, it's going to take us an eternity to really behold that and become that. Now the fruit takes a little bit longer. It took the disciples at least three and a half years. So they, they sat at his feet daily. We have the word written word of God, but we have enough grace that the fruit takes some time. You've got to be very careful and discerning with the power. Because especially with some people that get born again, they have zeal. They're operating in the power and the gifts. They're seeing people healed through prayer. They're prophesying. They're speaking in tongues, which is all very good. But what happens and what has happened historically to the church is because they weren't rooted in the fruit and established in love, they fall, and now everybody doubts it. That's why I'm very patient with us as a church because we're building a foundation of love and very practical that we grow in the fruit so that when the power is manifested, everything is established so that the glory of the Lord can be fully certain made out there. So as Alicia is giving, just begin playing, and I just want to, for Andrew that didn't hear this, and for those online, I want to say this again. Spiritual discernment in the head, soul realm, mind, will, emotions. You have to be able to discern the power. The power is the gifts of the Spirit, but it's also a loud mouth. Charisma, anything that's charismatic. Every leader knows how to influence through words. That's why you even look at dictators. They learn how to use their body and speak authoritatively in a certain word. It's called rhetoric to get more power. 
That's part of charisma. You have to be discerning. We have to be discerning of this power. It's meant to be a really good thing, but it's also used for really evil. This can come quickly. This takes more time. This takes the most amount of time. But in God's kingdom, this is the most important. Then this. Then this. We're not going to deny any of these. But as long as I'm standing here, our primary focus is always going to be this. Then this. And this should just be an outflow of what's established here. Do I get an amen? Amen.